Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Nasiri, and my goal is to help military veterans thrive in their civilian career. Today is episode number 240 with Jan Rutherford. I found a lot of them have been in such a prominent position for so long, it's really hard for them, um, you know, from a pride perspective. And uh, oftentimes they they just want to recite their resume. And it's like, nobody really cares. I'm sorry, but they'll say, I thank you for your service. That's great. But I, you know, they need to be curious about the problems, you know, at a strategic level and not, you know, oftentimes some of those leaders will start listening to something the business people say, and then they'll just jump right in and say, here's how to solve that. And it's like, you know what? You don't have industry expertise. You don't know the context. You, you, you would be a lot more influential if you just ask some really good questions. Well, I hope that this is the first in a series of interviews with Jan because it was an exceptional conversation. In this conversation, Jan and I talk about sales and how crucial it is in business and yet how little experience we get with this in the military. We talk about the importance of crucible experiences and how to create them and use them to change your narrative. We talk about the difference between civilian and military leaders and how civilians may often be more adaptable in a business setting than veterans. We talk about traits you should consider dropping from the military as you enter the civilian workforce, and we talk extensively about entrepreneurship. As always, at beyondtheuniform.io, you will find show notes with links to everything we discuss, including over 239 other episodes just like this. You'll also find information about Beyond the Uniform's coaching program, where you can get connected with a subsidized, certified executive and career coach to help you in your next career move, whether that's determining whether or not to leave the military or whether or not to take a new job after 20 years outside of the military. It is a fantastic resource, and we're really proud to be offering that. So with that, let's dive in to my first of hopefully many conversations with Jan. Well, joining me today in Portland, Oregon, though he does spend a fair amount of time in Denver as well, is Jan Rutherford. Jan, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Hey, thanks, Justin. I'm really, really excited to be here. And I, I want to give a special thanks to Kimberly Jung from episode 216 when she talked about her experience with Rumi Spies. She talked about um, Jan, and that's that's how we were connected. Uh, for listeners, you should know that Jan is the founder of Self Reliant Leadership, an executive and military veteran program for leaders who are selfless, adventurous, and possess heroic aspirations. He entered the U.S. Army at age 17, weighing 114 pounds, and spent six years in special forces as a medic and A-team executive officer, and three years as a military intelligence officer. In addition, in addition to having over 25 years of business and healthcare experience, he is the co-host of the Leadership Podcast and the author of The Littlest Green Beret on self, Self-Reliant Leadership where half the proceeds go to the Special Operations Warrior and Green Beret Foundations. And so um, maybe to, uh, to kick things off, Jen, if you were talking to someone who's on active duty, how would you describe the work you do with self-reliant leadership? Well, I, I would say that it's um, actually very similar to the work I did when I was a, a 19-year-old sergeant um, and a Special Forces instructor because – Back then, my goal was to help develop leaders and to to try to be a role model and to be competent in what I was teaching. And back then, I was a, a medic, so a lot of the courses I taught had to do with that. But um, it's, it's actually really similar because it's all about developing other people and um, helping them, you know, be better versions of themselves. And at the same time, I continue – to face my own hypocrisy. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, one of the things I'll add to the show notes for listeners is, um, is a link to a TEDx talk that Jan did that, that is definitely worth checking out. Um, I just wanted to make a, a little bit of space for the abbreviated version of, because um, I think this will play into where self-reliant leadership came from. Usually we kind of start the discussion about uh, where someone left the military, but could you talk about just kind of 
how you joined the army and and what role that yeah. played in this this journey of self reliance yeah so so i uh, i actually was uh so small in in school that um you know sports just wasn't an option for me i i weighed 65 pounds as a high school freshman and my senior year i weighed 101 so i wasn't going to play what i was passionate about which was football so i threw myself into the band and actually thought I wanted to major in music at one point. And when I realized we didn't have money for college, I, I thought, well, I'll, I'll join the, the army and, and I'll, I'll be in the band. And I, I went <laughs> for an audition. And on the way back from that audition, I had this giant epiphany on a plane that um, a, a career in music just wasn't the way to go for me, that, that I was good, but I wasn't super talented and I would probably struggle amongst the best of the best. And so I told the recruiter when I landed that I didn't want to be in the band, but I wanted to jump out of planes and be the best trained medic in the army. And he said, I should go special forces. And I thought that was military police. And when he clarified it was a Green Berets, I thought, I, you know, I weigh 101. I, I can't be a Green Beret. And this recruiter told me I could. And, and I believed him. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made because – making it through that despite all the difficulty and and you know this giant crucible it it gave me the confidence that i needed for the rest of my life Mm. and it's just like incredible to think i'm just noticing that it's incredible to think that like that one moment and that one person's belief in you changed you know it seems like it changed your life and it's just it's a powerful reminder of how a a short simple interaction can have such a massive impact well you think about um how much guff um, army recruiters and any military recruiters take and a lot of times people think you know they've been um you know sidelined in their career if they go to the recruiting command and you think about it in some ways you have more power and influence over the trajectory of people's lives than any other point in the army possibly yep and um, this was back in the late 70s when a lot of the recruiters were getting in trouble for lying to recruits and giving them crappy contracts. And um, that's the movie Private Benjamin came out and kind of made fun of that, that, you know, the recruiters are telling people they would be at a resort in Bali. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I just had this great recruiter who told me like it was. And um, he told me it'd be hard, but he I think he saw grit. I, I think that's what he saw. He thought, you know, that I was going to be scrappy and and that's what it really took. And and at the time, I didn't know that's what it took. I thought, you you know, you needed to be built like Rambo mm. um, in order to make it. So, yeah, it was it was, it was quite quite the thing. And it also um, speaks to the fact that when we are in leadership positions and positions where we can influence others, um, that we might not remember everything we said to someone at a pivotal point in their life, but they're going to remember everything mm. we said. <laughs> That's so true. That's so true. Yeah. Um, well, I want to spend the bulk of the time talking about self-reliant leadership, but I had two questions to lead up to that just to kind of lay the foundation for listeners. And the first one is if you could take us back to when you left the armor, army, what was your transition like? And in particular, what was that first job search like? Yeah, that's it's I love talking about this because it was it was so different when when I got out because you know the internet really didn't exist. So everything was snail mail. So what I did as a junior military officer because I went from being enlisted um and, and earned my commission, so I was um a senior second um uh, first lieutenant. And so you know, the, the kind of the reality for people that are getting out, the junior military officers, the lieutenants and captains actually in some ways have the easiest time because they're really in high demand. And there's lots of firms out there that want to place junior military officers. So I went to this this um, group called Career Seminars, and um, they gave me a whole bunch of books to read, a whole bunch of homework and questions to answer and how to write my resume. And I took all that super seriously. I probably spent two hours a night for a year just getting ready and applying for jobs. And that meant sending, you know, old fashioned letters. And I wish I had saved them because I got a stack of probably an inch and a half of papers of rejection letters. And this is back when people actually 
would tell you you didn't get the job. And, um, and so I had all these rejection letters, but I just persisted because I knew I was getting out on July 16th which was a Friday, and I knew I had to have a job on July 18th because I had a wife and a little baby, and we had no money. So I had to I had to have a job. And so I worked through this company called Career Seminars. I worked on my own and um, ended up actually getting the job on my own, and it was with a pharmaceutical company, one of, at the time, the 100 best companies to work for in the country. And I felt so honored and privileged and I ended up being hired along with 17 other junior military officers um, as a pharmaceutical salesperson. And our sales class had 17 prior military folks and about 17, you know, 22 year old college kids that had just graduated. So we were, uh, most of us were 27, so we were five years older. And at the time, we all felt five years behind where we should have been, which mm. ended up not being true. Mm. I I have this powerful mental <laughs> image of um uh there's a book Stephen King wrote a book called On Writing and he um mm. talks about when he was first aspiring to be a writer he would just like you said he would write in letters to magazines with his articles and he would get uh mailed back to him rejection letters and he was staying in a loft and had this big um uh, board across the ceiling and with a thick, you know, three inch thick nail on it. And he would just slap those rejection letters <laughs> up. And by the time he got his first article published, it was, you know, that three inch thick yep. nail was just stacked with rejection letters. And so I'm thinking of you with the, you know, just the determination to, in the face of that rejection to keep going. And it sounds like the, the, you know, the providing for your family was a significant motivator. Oh but yeah. I'm sure we'll get into this, but I love that. Um, what you had called earlier grit and that mm -hmm. thought of determination and resilience in pushing through those perceived setbacks to continue on until you really got what you were wanting. Yep. Yeah. It was, I, I wish I had saved those letters. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I'd love to take a picture of it and, you know, it was funny because some of the notables that rejected me, like Merck or, you know, some other big pharmaceutical companies, um, about a year after I got out, were coming trying to recruit me. And um, I thought it was funny and ironic. And I also felt like I was in the best company there was to be in. And most people that look back at this old pharmaceutical company called Marion Laboratories out of Kansas City would say, it was the best company they ever worked for. Mm. And it was notable because it had two values, and it was real simple. Those who produce shall share in the results and treat others you'd, as you'd like to be treated. Mm. It was literally task, you know, those who produce share in the results, and it was relationship, the golden rule. Mm. Task relate, And that's what I learned in the military about leadership was balanced task and relationship and that's what that company was all about it's just very simple and it was um, you know in some ways as great a leadership um, development experience as I had in the military and and before we get into the starting point of self-reliant leadership what would you want listeners to know about your career between leaving the army and and starting your own company Wow, I love that question because when I got out, they, you know, the people that were helping place junior military officers basically said, you, you have two choices as you enter civilian life. You can be a manufacturing manager in a manufacturing plant, and I envisioned wearing a hairnet, <laughs> or you can be a salesperson, and I envisioned a car salesperson. Well, I went the route of sales and I focused on pharmaceutical because I had been a medic and I thought at the time, boy, I'm really not selling. I'm out educating physicians. I'm going toe to toe with physicians. Well, I, I didn't really know how competitive I was until I got into sales and I realized I wasn't educating doctors. I was selling to them. I was trying to persuade and convince and influence them. And I truly believed like most good salespeople that that, you know, we had the best product. And so, you know, in those 20 years, um, a lot of it had to do with sales, sales management, product development, business development, marketing, but it was all about 
revenue creation, generating revenue, which is one of the big differences between being in the military and being in the business world. And, and it actually is what the business world values the most is revenue creation and revenue generation. And I'm so glad I, I got those skills um, because they have served me really well as an entrepreneur because a lot of entrepreneurs want to be entrepreneurs, have great ideas, but they don't want – they hate selling things or they don't know how to sell. And when you learn how to sell, you really realize – it, it's not something that's manipulation. It's actually developing friendships and figuring out people's challenges and helping them solve problems. Um, and it's so similar to leadership and teaching. So anyway, that's I, that's how I spent um, about I love 20, that. 20 years. <laughs> I love that too. I think that um, people who have listened to a lot of these episodes have probably heard me say something like this before, but it's, I think that sales gets a negative perception, negative rap in the military. And, uh, the a professor I greatly admired in business school, Irv Grossbeck, who's a partial owner of the Boston Celtics, a very successful man has had always just kind of the, his reverberating cadence was, if you want to go in, on, into entrepreneurship, you need to get sales experience. And what you pointed out that I, I really liked is first of all, how, that's not necessarily something that we get to practice a lot or extensively in the military. But then also I like the way that you kind of shift this from, um, this is not, excuse me, a uh, used car salesman. It's not this pushy approach, but you can take this consultative approach that when you really believe in the product, it is doing good in the world. You are selling something you believe in. And that's a way to, to I think, kind of twist it around where it's not you're, you're viewing as being intrusive or pushy or the things that I think people characterized with that cartoony impression of a salesperson rather than the actuality of it. And yeah. I, I'm sure we'll get into this as well with your work, but I just, every entrepreneur I know, like selling is such a critical part of that and, and belief in what you're doing and being able to articulate it well, all of these things which you get th uh, through practicing selling. Yeah. And I, I would add, when I'm coaching executives, one of the first questions I'll ask them is, what do you want? I'll, I'll ask that to transitioning veterans too, and you'll hear lots of different things. And one of the things that, that comes up often is of the value of freedom. I, I want to have autonomy. I want to be my own boss. I want to be able to make X amount of money or whatever. And to me, if those things are important to you, then you have to figure out um, you know, how, how to sell because that skill set – is critical to realizing that value that you cherish so much. And in some ways in the military, you are able to develop those skills. I mean, I was a military intelligence officer, which meant I had to brief colonels and generals. And most of the time, you know, they were blasting me. I mean, they asked me questions until I couldn't answer them anymore, made me feel terrible. Um, so you kind of got thick skin. Um, and, and chances are, if you reflect on your military experience, there were places maybe you had to convince a supply sergeant to give you something for your team that that was outside the rules but there was probably points where you had to persuade and understand how systems worked and and gain influence and those are absolutely critical skills in the business world and and again if if you have a value that's somewhere around boy I, I want to be my own boss I want to um, have freedom and autonomy and, and purposefulness, then you, you've, you've got to learn to develop those, those skills. I love that. So, so take us through what was the genesis of starting Self-Reliant Leadership? Well, it, it actually went back almost to the very second I joined that big pharmaceutical company because as much as I loved it and loved the people, I wanted to be my own boss. And back then, I I thought there was two things I needed. One um, was, you know, tons of tons of guts. Um, that's the polite way of saying it. And then the other one was I thought I needed a ton of money, a ton of capital. And here I was, you know, wife, kids, mortgage, all that stuff. And I thought, well, I can't. It'd be irresponsible to just go out and start my own company. So I said, well, I'll wait till the kids are grown. And um, and so I kept planning and in at times there was, you know, a bunch of times in my career and jobs I took, I was miserable, you know, and I thought, well, I'm paying my dues. Um, I'm getting closer. And 
I started it a- after, you know, those 20 plus years and it's, I haven't looked back and I've said to my wife numerous times, gosh, I, ha- I wish I had done this 10 years earlier. I wish after 10 years in the business world, corporate, I had done it. And she always reminds me, she says, you weren't ready. Mm. We weren't ready. And, and of course she's right because, um, what I do now, I, I needed to have the experiences to be able to coach senior level executives. I needed to have been a CEO and a vice president and, and had multiple points of success and failure in, in, in my work in order to be really effective at what I'm doing now. But I can tell you, I, I really wish I had figured out how to do it sooner. And, and again, what I would say to people out there is just do it. I mean, you don't need to do analysis paralysis. You don't need to spend months and, and months researching and writing a business plan. If you think you've got something, um, get out there and sell it and see what the traction is. See if people are biting and you don't have to quit your day job. Um, you can kind of get feelers out there and the market will tell you what it values um, way better than sitting on your computer all day and, and get, you know, doing the ready, aim, aim, aim. What I'm saying is ready, aim, fire. Mm. I love that too. I, I, I think of uh, another book that I have read a couple times. It's called Big Magic by um, Elizabeth Gilbert, who mm. wrote Eat, Pray, Love, which I have not read. But um, the book is about creativity. And one of the things that really sticks with me is um, she talks about aspiring authors always approach her and say, yeah, I'm going to quit my job and write this book. And she's always, always cringing at that and thinks yeah. back to her own career where – um, it was only after the success of Eat, Pray, Love, which was a monumental success, that she quit her, her day job and started writing full time. And yeah. she, she kind of talks about this in terms of inspiration, rewarding those who get up at 5 a.m. and inspiration, rewarding those who fill in the nooks and crannies of their schedule to pursue that dream. And so one thing I'm, I'm um, appreciating about what you're saying is the 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 desire to go do things, but also how you're saying, you know, what I'm hearing you're saying is um, that doesn't necessarily entail leaving your job. And there's so much work you can do on the sides to validate an idea, to start to generate revenue. Yeah. And for those yeah. of you listeners who have listened to you, any of the entrepreneurial interviews that I've done, you'll you'll recall how almost all of them, it took years and years and years to not just generate revenue, but also to generate revenue that they could pay themselves some sort of salary. Yep. And so if you can find a way to offset that and, 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 and provide for your family and for yourself, it's just giving you more runway rather than let me white knuckle this thing. And if I can get it going in three months, great. Otherwise, I got to look for a job. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll offer up two other things to the audience. Um, when when I started writing my book, the best thing I did was tell everybody I knew I was writing a book mm. because then the pressure was there. But I can tell you, it took five years to get that book done. Wow. And when I looked back, I thought, gosh, if I'd written 500 words a day, I could have done it in six months. But I couldn't write 500 words a day. It it had to kind of come to me mm-hmm. and and how I was going to assemble it and put it together. That was one thing. The other thing I'll, I'll mention, too, is um, uh, somebody the other day said, you know, they didn't want to be – somebody I know said, I'm, I'm scared about becoming an entrepreneur because it's lonely. And I said, geez, you know, I've never felt lonely as an entrepreneur. And if I count all the people around me that I think are on my team, whether I pay them, you know, as 1099s or they just help me, it's, it's 40 people that I think are part of my team. And I think if you go out there and you feel like you're all alone, you, you're not ready. You you need to have, uh, I don't know if it's 40, but you need to have people around you that are rooting for you, that you can turn to, that are going to help you. And I know when I went out on my own, I told my wife, I said, hey, worst case, here's what we're going to make. Best case, here's what we're going to make. Um, I was way off in, in, in um, a good surprise. Mm. I, 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 um, and I think it's because I was so ready and, you know, what I was saying right before I started, you know, a year or two before I started, I said, you know, this darn day job is getting in the way of what I really want to do. Mm. And I, I knew and, and I said, I, I know I'm going to be busy. I know I'm going to be fulfilled and I know I'm going to make money. I just don't know how much. And I have found, I know it sounds really um, trite, 
but I, I really believe if you do what you love, um, the money follows. Mm -hmm. I really believe that because when you do what you love, you're going to see the value it provides others and you're going to have the confidence to actually raise your rates and charge more. And because you know, people are getting a lot of value from it. And that's one of the biggest sins that entrepreneurs make is underpricing their offering, mm. their services or product, whatever that is. But if you know it provides value, that there's a value or there's a return on what you're doing, you can feel very comfortable um, charging, you know, a, a premium fee. Mm. I love that. Um, could you talk about the expeditions you lead? I believe that's what Kim, who introduced us, had, yeah. had gone through. Yeah, so a, a part of self-reliant leadership, which is keynotes and coaching and facilitating and consulting, but one component are the crucible expeditions that we run. And right now it's about four a year in places like Moab, Utah, and Alaska. Um, we've been to Patagonia. We're hoping to go to Kilimanjaro in 2019. But um, what we do is we take senior level executives that need to basically step back and work on the business instead of in it. And we pair them with military veterans that are in transition, that are looking to get into the business world. And we take them out in the woods. The executives are in a, an environment they're not comfortable with. The veterans are in an environment, most of them, especially the army folks, are very comfortable yet they're scared to death of the business world. They don't, speak the, they don't speak the vocabulary, they're intimidated by these executives. And what happens so quickly on these is the, the veterans go, hey, maybe there are good civilians, maybe there are people that will have my back. And hey, there's a lot I can learn from these folks. And these problems they're talking about, I'm familiar with, because most of the problems are people, and I, I've been working with people and the executives, the, the big aha out there is, boy, I've got to slow down to speed up. I need to do this whole thing. The military calls an after action review and really assess what we're doing on a continuous basis and not just go 90 miles an hour all the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we run those at the same time we take a videographer and we document them and on the website we've got, you know, a, a dozen of these, at least a dozen of these films um, documented in those experiences. And usually when we go, we try to have a hypothesis. Um, you know, last last year it was really about what happens if we have one team that's leaderless and one team that has a designated leader or what happens when we really work hard to diversify a team or, hey, what role does kindness play in leadership? So that that's what we're doing in 2019. Like I said, we've got four, four trips planned and, um, we've got the executives coming on board now. And in Q1, we'll, we'll start, um, um, selecting the veterans to participate. And for listeners, I'll add in the show notes for this episode, a link to where you can find out more about those expeditions. Um, you, you've, Partly touched on this already, but um, in these expeditions and in just the work that you've done um, in your career, have you noticed any trends in how veterans lead as distinct from how civilians or executives you work with lead? Yeah, and yeah, yes, and and um, it depends on what kind of veteran because a senior of officer versus a senior NCO or a junior NCO versus a junior um, officer. You know, I, I kind of break it up into four groups. So all four of those veterans lead differently. And, and so um, if I had to just lump the veterans into one group, I would say, I, I'm, I'm, well, I'm actually, I, I want to hear that, but I'm actually curious that I, I that, that is, um, that now seems intuitive that you say it, but I didn't think of that before you said it. What's what's the? Could, could you just briefly describe what those differences are between those those groups yep. in the military and how they lead? Yeah. So, so let's take um, a junior military officer, like a captain, thirty years old, um, that's got getting out and on these trips. Um, they're gung ho. Um, you know, they they've probably been to a good school. They've had a good education. Um, they've had a little bit of TLC. Um, with with mentors, um, 
you know, they, they kind of knew what they wanted to do and, and that they went to college and they went in the military. And again, people are clamoring for them. So, you know, they, they kind of lead like a lot of um, more like a civilian. Um, but um, a, a lot of times it'll be a little bit a- academic. Hmm. When you look at the junior NCOs like E6s and below, staff sergeants and below, um, you know, and and I I was enlisted before I was an officer, and you know some of those folks, um, you know, had a tougher life, a little, you know, some of the school of hard knocks, and so it's a lot more pragmatic, it's a lot more um, learned by doing, and um, and it's it's usually pretty tactical. Um, the senior NCOs like the E8s and E9s and sergeant majors, what I find when they're out there that they they go right into training mode. They, you know, we have a lot of special operations folks that have been out with us and, and they're right into thinking everybody on the trip wants to be a commando. So, so they're, they're training them. And, um, at some point I'll have to say, Hey, this is cool. They love hearing your war stories, but they're not going into your world. You're going into theirs. You need to get curious about what makes the business world tick. Hmm. Um, the, the senior officers like O fives, O sixes, and colonels. I found a lot of them have been in such a prominent position for so long. It's really hard for them, um, you know, from a pride perspective. And uh, oftentimes they they just want to recite their resume. Hmm. And it's like nobody really cares. I'm sorry, but they'll say I thank you for your service. That's great, but I, you know, they need to be curious about the problems, you know, at a strategic level and not, you know, oftentimes some of those leaders will start listening to something the business people say, and then they'll just jump right in and say, Here, here's how to solve that. And it's like, you know what, you don't have industry expertise. You don't know the context. Y- you, you would be a lot more influential if you just ask some really good questions. Mm. That, that's steer- great advice for marriage too. I have no, no <laughs> quantitative data on this, but qualitatively, the jumping into solution has not worked well for me. <laughs> right. Well, well, it it doesn't work well uh, there either. And and you know, I think those are the big differences. And again, you know, the military, whether it's special operations or or not, they're used to you know r- really having clear cut coal um, um, structure and roles and responsibilities. Whereas, and this might surprise you, um, the business leaders, I think, in a lot of ways, are a lot more adaptable than our veterans. I mean, we, you think of the veterans, and they're always thinking about contingency plans. But again, it's all within the structure. And everything's you know, kind of crystal clear. If this happens, this is what... Um, but the business world moves so fast and is so fluid and can react to market dynamics to achieve objectives... I think a lot of times um, it's a lot more collaborative than 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 sometimes we are in, in the military. Um, and, you know, the outliers and our, you know, those opinions are, are welcome and needed. Whereas in the military, most of the units, you know, everybody's kind of the same. They were they went through the same training. They were selected the same way. And groupthink isn't necessarily thought of as something bad. It's like, good, everybody's on the same page. Whereas in the business world, if, if everybody's on the same page, you start to think, hmm, are, are we, are we um, complacent here? Are we looking at all the right – are we thinking about all the right angles? Have we missed something here? I love that. I think that's such a great distinction about adaptability and um, – and, and- you know that, that kind I, I sure hope I'm not offending any of no, our veterans you, you, out there. You know, I, I are one. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like I'm. My, my mind is when you were saying that, my mind kind of spun off in a different direction, which is um, something I need to think through. But just off the cuff, it's um, I think that it, it is a good thing. But I think that our society holds um, veterans and people in the military in very high esteem, and. Mm-hmm. What you're saying, I completely agree with. 
And then there's part of me that tenses up as if I'm doing something wrong because I'm saying something that doesn't say that that people in the military are the best and the brightest and, and, and the best in every way, which is just not true. Nothing. No one is that way. Right. And right. so uh, noticing my own tension about that, I realized like, OK, there is a biased, I think, in our society to not say anything like what you just said. And that's doing a disservice to people in the military. Like we need to be able to have honest, direct conversations about the strengths and weaknesses that our members of our military bring into the civilian world. And if we just gloss over that and just say, oh, you're ahead of everyone else, you're great, you're going to get the job of your dreams, it's it's doing a, a severe disservice to people in the military. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, a good perspective. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's a, that's a cool thing that happens out on those crucibles is, you know, we have four or five whatever days to, to basically have no distractions. Mm-hmm. And for, for people, I mean, you, you you can't be anything but real for four days, 24 hours a day with, with people. And that was the thing I loved about the military was when you're a little bit cold, wet, tired, and hungry, I, I mean, it reveals people's true character. Hmm. And it's it's hard in the business world because oftentimes it might take two years before you're really in a stressful situation with your team where you see what people are made of. Because a lot of times it's kind of status quo. You're You're – you know, every day is, is status quo, but out in the field, you can see if somebody's carrying too little or too much or if somebody's fallen behind or tired. But when we are managing and leading in the business world, we look around at people at their workstations on their computers and think, eh, everybody's happy. Everybody's mm-hmm. with me. And we have no idea what's what's going on in their life. I've got a a, a client that does a great thing before every meeting. He he basically gets everyone to stand up and says in one word, how you feeling? You know, what's one word that describes how you're feeling right now? And the the culture of this organization is people are really honest. And some days, you know, you hear all this positive stuff. And most recently I, I heard a lot of people saying tired, stressed. Um, and, and it's a reminder that, boy, you, you never know what's going on in mm. people's lives. You know, you think, Hey, uh, they're going to give me a thousand percent every single day, every single minute. And, and that's just not the reality. And I think as leaders and especially as military leaders, we're we're usually tuned into that pretty well. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a, a strength that we have is to into it, you know, that 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 those sort of um, nuances and dynamics. Mm. Is, is there any any trait that you've seen that you would I, I think that it's easy to come to mind for the traits that I want to preserve for the military and that I would love for other veterans to bring with them into the civilian world. But but flipping that on its its head, do any traits stand out to you as ones that listeners should consider dropping or maybe turning down the volume on as they enter the civilian world? Yeah, I, I alluded to it before, and that is if I if I had one piece of advice for people transitioning, it would be be curious. Just just be curious. You, you don't have to waste all this time and effort translating your resume and all this other stuff that you do that's you sitting behind a, a computer. Get out there. Um, people are going to take a meeting with you to have coffee because you're a military veteran. And rather than tell them about all your heroics and, and you know your whole CV, just ask them what's going on in their world, what their challenges are, and don't don't jump in and tell them how to solve it. Um, and, and one other thing I would recommend for those that really have a lot of initiative is to think about creating a hypothesis when you're networking and you're getting out. For example, my hypothesis is that all the problems out there have to do with poor coaching. I think businesses could run better if if managers knew how to coach better. So if that's your hypothesis, then make your questions that you're asking people around your hypothesis and eventually you're going to have you're going to be a lot more informed. So when you're meeting with people, you could say, you know, I've I've asked a lot of people about you know some of their issues and it really comes back to this coaching. Um would you agree? And you know, because one of the things that I found in the military, um, you know, from a coaching perspective was X, Y, Z. And you're able to position that with business data rather than just, hey, here is my experience in the military. 
I love it. Um, I know that we're we're coming up on the end of our time, and one thing that's apparent is um, I'm looking forward to connecting you with with you <laughs> offline when you're in Denver. But I would love to have you back because I I know we we didn't get into some of the things I would love to cover, such as your TEDx talk and um, advice to entrepreneurs and resources and writing a book. And I think there's a lot of other things where you could help our listeners. But I always like to make space um, for the last question to maybe just in this moment, uh, what have we not covered that you want to make sure that listeners know before we wrap up and before we have you back on the show, hopefully for a second time? Yeah, well, I big part of my message in, in my my TED was when you create your own crucible, that is when you create a severe test for yourself, you know, something that you might fail at, you change your narrative. And when you're getting out of the military, you are literally talking about changing your narrative. You, you know, when we interviewed General Stanley McChrystal on our podcast, one of the insights he gave us was a soldier is what I was. A leader is who I am. But he didn't figure that out right away. It took a little while. And so I, I, I say, you know, approach this whole transition as a crucible. Um, and, and in a way, well, in every way, you're in charge of it. And you can you can see my TED talk on um, at, at the on the YouTube channel and and um and my website for all kinds of resources at selfreliantleadership.com. And, and Justin, it's been an absolute pleasure. You ask um, some great questions. Oh, thank you. Well, it's easy when there's there's so much knowledge uh, from which to draw from you on this. And um, for listeners, I'll have a link to Jen's TED Talk. I'll have a link to Self Reliant Leadership, to his book, and to um, everything else that we discussed. But thank you for your time, and thank you for uh, what is hopefully part one of an ongoing discussion. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beyond the Uniform. There are over 200 free episodes at beyondtheuniform.io. They're classified by the industry of focus, the functional role the person plays, and more. Beyond the Uniform is hosted, produced, and edited by me, Justin Asiri. Our director of outreach, responsible for sponsorship and guest episodes, is Steve Bain. Our editor, responsible for the show notes and text transcripts for all episodes, is Kathleen Dillon. Our data analytics and insights advisor is Andrew Woolridge. If you are enjoying Beyond the Uniform, you can help us out by telling your veterans and friends in the military about this free resource. There is more information on the website about how you can sponsor an episode or donate to our program to help us grow the work that we're doing. Be sure to check out the coaching section of beyondtheuniform.io where you can be paired with professional, subsidized coaches to help you figure out your next career move. You can sign up for our newsletter to be up to date on the latest happenings at Beyond the Uniform. And in each show notes section, there is a link to audible.com, which is providing a free audiobook of your choice to Beyond the Uniform listeners. You get a free book of your choosing, and Beyond the Uniform gets $15 to subsidize the cost of the show, regardless of whether you can continue with audible.com or not. Check that out and more in the show notes for this episode. Keep the feedback coming. Let me know what resources would help you in your career, and we'll do our best to make that happen. Take care, be safe, and I'll be back next week with more interviews with military veterans about their civilian career.